He says Seoul will pay a lot more, but South Korea insists talks on the issue haven't even started. Plus, missiles have been flying, but the US says it still wants talks with North Korea, but expects dialogue to resume in the coming weeks. So let's start with our ongoing coverage of the Seoul-Tokyo trade row. President Moon Jae-in is gearing up once again to ensure Japan's unprecedented export restrictions on South Korea do the least amount of damage to the nation's economy as possible. The president will chair a National Economic Advisory Council meeting this morning where they will devise some sophisticated counteractions to tackle Tokyo's trade controls. The Blue House says the meeting is an opportunity to collect opinions from a variety of angles, from both members of academia and the business world. President Moon will be joined by Finance Minister Hong Nam Gi and other related ministers and presidential advisers. South Korea's Prime Minister Lee nak says Japan's economic retaliation is an unfair decision that should not come from a world-leading country. He was speaking at a related minister's meeting this morning to discuss the details of Japan's new export regulations that will take effect later this month. He added that Japan had allowed one of the export-regulated materials, EUV photoresist, to be exported to South Korea. He also emphasized that South Korea will increase diplomatic efforts to recover from Japan's export curbs. And Japan has revealed the details of the new regulations that will take effect later this August when South Korea is whipped off Tokyo's so-called white list of trading partners. Now local companies can try and assess just how badly they'll be affected when it gets uh, a lot more complicated for them to get the materials they need. Hong Yu with the details. Japan's detailed enforcement of export regulations includes a decision last Friday to exclude South Korea from the so-called white list of preferential trading partners. These new regulations will come into effect after 21 days. This means that some items out of the 1,100 strategic materials that can be used for military purposes will not benefit from a simplified inspection process. And non-regulated items could also be subject to separate approval and will have to go through a long process of export approval by Japan's trade ministry should Japan consider that they could be used to make weapons. High-purity hydrogen fluoride, photoresist, and fluorine polyamide, the three semiconductor and display materials under Japan's export restrictions fall under this category. Japan also announced a new system of classifying trade partners into groups A to D. Under the new system, countries included on the white list will be classified into Group A, in which Japan's regulated items benefit from a separate screening exemption if they get approval from Japan's trade ministry once every three years. South Korea is categorized into Group B and will have to go through a more difficult process of export approval. But even for countries in Group B, some items get special general comprehensive authorization so they can benefit from a screening exemption. Special general comprehensive authorization is given to Japanese companies selected by the Japanese government for their approved export management. Countries categorized into Group D are those that Japan's trade ministry judges to have low credibility like North Korea and Iraq. Hong Yu, Arirang News. So now that Japan's list is out in the public domain, South Korean firms are bracing for the impact of these export restrictions. However, so far at least, Tokyo hasn't designated any additional items that require individual approval. That is the toughest level of export control. Despite this seemingly small win, Seoul is not letting its guard down. Im In Sun reports. Japan's detailed regulations released on Wednesday for the enforcement of taking South Korea off the whitelist did not include additional goods subject to tougher export regulations. 
Seoul had thought that Tokyo might add more items to the list of goods that are strictly regulated when exported to South Korea. Japan had previously declared that it would impose tougher regulations on three key materials used for making semiconductors and displays in early July. Japan already put regulations on three key materials for semiconductors and excluded South Korea from the list of preferred trading partners. If Japan puts regulations on additional items, then it will make the situation worse. It appears that Japan didn't want the burden of creating more tension, with the U.S. trying to mediate the situation, the ongoing boycott movements in Korea, and the possible influence on the global and local economy. However, some worry that the ambiguous terms used in the detailed regulation may give room for Japan to put other products on the list of goods subject to tougher regulations any time they want in the future. Once the goods are included on the list, the Japanese government can prolong the approval process or reject the export request from South Korean companies. South Korea's trade official said that it's hard to say whether Japan has refrained from expanding the current measures and that they need to wait and see whether Japan will take any further related measures. Im min Sun, Arirang News. Now, U.S. President Donald Trump dropped a bombshell of a tweet late Wednesday Korea time. In it, he said South Korea has agreed to pay a lot more for the cost of stationing American troops on the Korean peninsula and talks are already underway. Scrambling for a response given the time the tweet was posted, Seoul was quick to point out that official negotiations have actually yet to start. Kan hyung reports. President Trump says South Korea has agreed to sharply increase its contribution for the shared cost of keeping the roughly 28,000 American troops stationed on the Korean Peninsula. South Korea uh, and I have made a deal where they're paying a lot more money and they're going to pay a lot more money. And the relationship is a very good one. But I felt all along, I felt for years it was a very unfair one. So they've agreed to pay a lot more and they will agree to pay a lot more than that. And we're with them. We're with them. Trump tweeted earlier in the day that talks to increase Seoul's contribution had begun. The U.S. leader also said South Korea is a very wealthy nation that now feels obligated to contribute to the defense it receives from the U.S. military. However, shortly after Trump's tweet was posted, Seoul's foreign ministry said negotiations on the special measures agreement a bilateral deal between South Korea and the U.S. to share the cost of American forces in Korea have not started. The ministry said that during U.S. National Security Advisor John Bolton's visit to Seoul last month, South Korea and the U.S. agreed to proceed with the issue in a rational and fair direction, adding the two sides plan to discuss the finer details in the negotiations. The ministry also said it's working on selecting its next chief negotiator and forming a task force. Kan Young-woo, Arirang News. North Korea has been firing missile after missile over the past couple of weeks, but this kind of behavior has done little to dampen Washington's apparent enthusiasm for holding talks with the regime. In fact, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said on Wednesday that he's hopeful the two sides will resume negotiations sooner rather than later. Lee Jay with the details. Speaking to reporters at the U.S. State Department on Wednesday, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo says he's confident the U.S. and North Korea will resume denuclearization negotiations in the coming weeks. President Trump's uh, and this administration's strategy with respect to North Korea haven't changed. Uh, our effort is to achieve the full final uh, denuclearization of North Korea. Uh, we are hopeful that in the coming weeks we'll get back to the negotiating table to achieve that. Pompeo's optimism comes despite North Korea conducting four short-range ballistic missile tests over the past couple of weeks in protest over ongoing joint military exercises between Seoul and Washington. According to the top U.S. diplomat, as long as the North doesn't test nuclear weapons or ICBMs, the Trump administration is generally content. We, uh, we, we watch the actions that they're taking, the actions that are taking place inside of North Korea. And we are mindful that when we came in, there, were nu there was nuclear testing taking place. That has not occurred. 
There aren't long-range missiles being fired. Those are both good things. Uh, now the task is for us to deliver on what the two leaders agreed to back in June of last year in Singapore. The leaders of North Korea and the U.S. agreed to resume working-level denuclearization talks when they met at the inter-Korean border in June. However, the talks have yet to take place, despite earlier expectations they would restart in mid-July. Lee Seung-jae, Arirang News. President Trump is keeping the heat on the Federal Reserve to further cut interest rates. He tweeted Wednesday that the problem America faces is not China, but the Fed calling on the U.S. central bank to carry out bigger and faster rate cuts and immediately stop its, quote, ridiculous quantitative tightening. The tweets come on the heels of surprise rate cuts by Thailand, India and New Zealand on Wednesday. President Trump has long criticized the Fed for acting too slowly and not slashing rates fast enough. As part of its broad pressure against Chinese tech giant Huawei, the U.S. government has announced new rules that prohibit the federal purchase of telecommunication equipment from five Chinese firms, much like Huawei, the U.S. says the move is also based on national security concerns. Kim Hyo-sun with the details. The Trump administration has rolled out an interim rule that bans federal purchases of telecommunications equipment from five Chinese companies, including Huawei. Reuters reported Wednesday that the measure is separate from Washington's enlisting of Huawei in its blacklist in May, accusing the company of espionage and stealing intellectual property. It adds the latest move is in accordance to the National Defense Authorization Act that was passed last year, which restricts the use of federal budget to buy telecommunications equipment and video surveillance equipment from five Chinese firms due to concerns over national security. The interim measure will take effect from August 13th, and the final version will be announced after 60 days of accepting public comments. Reuters also explained that a broader ban, which will apply to contracts with any private companies that use equipment from the targeted firms, will be put in place from August 2020. In March, Huawei filed a lawsuit against the U.S. government over the defense policy bill, claiming the company is not controlled by the Chinese government, military or intelligence services. Kim Hyo-san, Arirang News. Samsung Electronics has unveiled its new Galaxy Note 10. This time, there are two kinds, a regular one and a 6.8-inch jumbo Note 10 Plus. Samsung's Galaxy Note 10 unpacked event took place at the Barclays Center in New York on Wednesday and was joined by over 4,000 excited people. The souped-up Note 10 Plus has a 7.5% boost in battery capacity over the Note 9. The Note 10 will retail at 949 US dollars, while the bigger model will cost you around an extra $50 or so. They'll hit store shelves on August 23rd. A global environmental watchdog has slammed Japan's plan to release one million tonnes of radioactive wastewater into the Pacific Ocean. In an article published by The Economist, Greenpeace nuclear specialist Sean Burney said releasing wastewater from the Fukushima nuclear plant would increase radioactive exposure for neighbouring countries, especially South Korea. He said such a huge amount of radioactive wastewater would require 770 times the amount of clean water to dilute the pollutants. He also noted that Tokyo has now given up providing explanation and is now keeping silent on the matter. U.S. President Donald Trump has visited the two cities, Dayton uh, in Ohio and El Paso in Texas, where two mass shootings happened last weekend to pay his respects and regards to the victims, their families, as well as the first uh, responders who did a wonderful job. For more on this and other news from around the world, let's turn to our Kim Dami. So, Dami, tell us the latest. Mark, President Trump just left El Paso, Texas, where he's been meeting with the victims from last Saturday's shootings uh, that killed 22 people and injured 26 others. People took to the streets to protest Trump's visit on Wednesday, demanding gun control. 
Uh, prior to his departure to Dayton, his uh, first stop, Trump said he doesn't think his often anti-illegal immigrant rhetoric has uh, contributed to the violence. Instead, he insisted his uh, message brings people together. He also expressed his deep concern about any and all hate groups. I am concerned about the rise of any group of hate. I don't like it. Any group of hate, I am, whether it's white supremacy, whether it's any other kind of supremacy, whether it's Antifa, whether it's any group of hate, I am. He added he'll do something about it, but didn't elaborate. Earlier, Trump also visited Dayton's Miami Valley Hospital to meet survivors and their families. He was greeted by a mixture of his supporters and anti-Trump protesters. At least 200 protesters gathered holding signs reading, Do Something and URY, and flying a baby Trump balloon. A new report shows 17 countries are currently facing extremely high water stress, and those countries are where a quarter of all humanity lives. According to World Resources Institute, the countries classified as experiencing a water crisis include India, Iran, and Botswana. Developed cities like Tokyo, Los Angeles, and Seoul are also under warnings to actively prepare against a water crisis. In terms of big cities with more than 3 million residents, 33 cities are suffering from water shortages. And by 2030, 12 more cities are expected to experience the same. Pakistan has announced it will downgrade diplomatic relations and suspend bilateral trade with India amid disputes over the territory of Kashmir. The decision came at a meeting of Pakistan's National Security Committee on Wednesday. Pakistan added that it will also look into other areas other than the trade when reviewing its relationship with India. The Indian government said on Monday it was scrapping a constitutional provision that allowed the Indian-administered part of Kashmir to make its own laws. Time now for our Life and Info segment where we focus on information that is uh, useful for your everyday life, whether you are in Korea or elsewhere around the world. Today, we're going to turn our focus to culture here in Korea, though, to tell us more about what's happening in South Korea right now. I'm uh, delighted to say our Won jong Hwan has joined me again in the studio. Good morning to you, jong Hwan. Good morning. Uh, what do you have for us today? So, Mark, um, I'm here in the studio today to tell you about an annual film festival which is held in the city of Chechon, uh, Chungcheongnam-do province. Mm. The Chechon International Music and Film Festival has been held every year since 2005 to introduce the latest films across all genres in which music plays a central role. The festival screens outstanding music-based films from dramas and documentaries to animations and experimental films. The festival runs from today until August 13th with Chechen's beautiful Chongpunghu Lake as a fitting backdrop. And one of the committee members says, this time visitors will be able to get closer to the festival than ever before. This year marks the festival's 15th anniversary, and under the slogan of Into the Citizens, we've prepared some programs to be held in downtown to get even closer to the visitors. So it's a big uh, anniversary, of course. So what's uh, special about this year's edition of this festival? So this year's uh, festival is expected to be the largest ever uh, in the festival's history, with over uh, 120 films uh, from nearly 40 countries, including Japan and China, being screened. Okay. Uh, I cannot go through all the films that will be screened uh, over the six days, but mm. let me just quickly introduce you the in opening film, Inna Dayard, The Soul of Jamaica. The film was directed by Peter Weber, who is best known for directing Hannibal Rising. It's a documentary film about legendary Jamaican reggae musicians in which reggae music and the performers touching stories are set against a backdrop of beautiful Jamaican scenery. The film will be screened just after the opening ceremony, which will take place this evening at 7 p.m. 
Sounds good. And I hear there are also plenty of other things to do mm -hmm. beside watching movies. Yes, exactly. Just like many other film festivals, the GIMF uh, celebrates Korea's midsummer days and nights with a packed programs. Mm. Uh, to introduce a few events, there's uh, music from renowned performers such as Hayes and Hee Sung at the One Summer Night event. Visitors can enjoy musical performances on an outdoor stage. And besides that, the dazzling music con concert for the fans, visitors can have a chance to connect with artists at a live show. Charming artists and guests at the gym live music talk will tell stories and explain the reasons behind their work. Visitors can also enjoy other activities such as music films, quizzes, three-minute caricatures, and a hard liquor adventure. So for those music and movie fans staying here in Korea, why not try Chechen this weekend? Well, a glowing recommendation from our very own Won Jong Hwan. Thank you very much for sharing that with us, Jong Hwan. And uh, we'll see you again next time. Next time. Thank you. Now it's time to take a quick look, like we like to do every Thursday, to uh, check out some other culture and sporting events that are taking place across South Korea. Good morning. Today is Eve 2, the beginning of autumn on East Asian calendars, but the heat is likely to intensify. Most southern parts of the country are under heat wave advisories, and it's very likely that heat wave alerts will be expanded during the day. And high humidity lingers as inner regions could see heavy passing showers, so have an umbrella handy today. Some thunder and lightning is also in the forecast. So it's going to be a hot and humid Thursday afternoon and Seoul will hit at 33 degrees, Daegu, Gyeongju getting up to 35 degrees this afternoon. Sunday is Baibo, which officially marks the last day of the hottest period of summer. And we can expect temperatures to ease next week. And so far, the ninth typhoon of the season, like Kima, is not expected to impact the Korean peninsula, but we can never be too sure this far out. But we'll keep you updated. That's Korea for you, and here's the international weather for viewers around the world. That's all the news and weather we have for now on this Thursday morning here in Seoul. Stay tuned to Arirang TV. And a reminder that our next newscast is coming up at noon Korea time in around an hour and a half from now. So until then, goodbye.